Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I was just thinking, God, it feels like it's taken us two years to do this. I know. I, I sort of first came across sort of the whole menopause with Kate Muir debate. And she said, we're going to do a documentary. And I was like, oh, my God, it's amazing that Davina's doing it. And oh, my God, we need to have a, a myriad of voices and just have all communities covered in that. And so um, and then we couldn't meet because of COVID and um, surgery times. So this feels like it's the right time to have these discussions now after so much has happened in the last two years. I wanted to quickly ask you, actually, because um, we were talking about trying to get this arena a lot more diverse. How hard is it to find people from your community that are prepared to talk about perimenopause and menopause? There is still a lot of difficulty and that reason is because um, one is that we don't see this phase of life uh, as being a problem because remember in Islam and in Hinduism and Sikhism culture, um, if you're on your period, um, it, you don't go to the mosque or the temple, you don't do Ramadan, you don't fast in those months. And so when you're on the transition and your periods are stopping, it's actually a time of celebration. So we don't see it as a, an issue at all. But with that, the symptoms that come with it, such as the hot flushes, and these are taken into context. So I said to a woman from Dubai, do you know, do you get hot flushes? And she said to me, stand in the Dubai heat and you'll know what a flush is. So when you're looking at the context of where these women are coming from in their climate, uh, you know, the, the, the history of their forefathers, to them, that it's not a, a, an issue in regards to that being problematic on their lifestyle. However, other symptoms, such as the mood related symptoms, now we have a massive taboo in regards to mental health anyway. Mm. Those sort of symptoms, I, I find that they are buried even further because what they do is that they don't want to talk about it. And so the concept is, is, well, actually, this is a time where I can reconnect with my faith. So if I pray harder, Allah will make you better. And I don't need support with this. So, again, there's this concept that things like that should just be kept under the veil. So we say, it's in Punjabi just means, do you know what? Let's not talk about this because actually it's a good thing that this part of my life is being celebrated, but all the mental health issues, people will think I'm crazy and question my connection with faith because especially in Islam, you know, when you hit your forties, not so much in the, uh, in the, the new, the newer generation, but there is this sort of connection with spirituality more so. And I wonder whether that's because the symptoms that they impact them, they feel that they're not supported by medical doctors when they go into the healthcare professional. And you and I both know, that when you go into that field with medical professionals, it can be slightly hit or miss who you see yeah. their knowledge base. So then you've got a woman who's using her cultural uh, nuances to be able to treat herself to go to the doctor and he might or she might mention, well, have you thought about hormone replacement therapy or antidepressants? Now, those are really scary sort of conversations already. So she'll leave the conversation going, well, that doesn't really fit with what I want to do with life. And there's, so there's not a meeting of mind because in the NHS, the conversation is, is that the patient comes empowered saying to the doctor, this is what I've looked at. This is what I've tried. And this is what I want you to do because we have 10 minute consultations. Well, this is this is exactly what I want to talk to you about today, because um, obviously there are there seem to be many um, kind of private doctors that are treating people in the menopause arena. But obviously not most people can't afford to go private. Yeah. And they've got to go to their NHS GP. But we all know how hard it is to get an appointment and how little time you have and how stretched you are. How can we best serve you? If we're going to go to the doctors and say, you know, um, if you're struggling with perimenopausal symptoms and you want to explore HRT, should you do your research beforehand online and then go and see the GP with a list of things? And what should you say? So I have a five point plan for my patients. Number one, find out in your GP practice before you hit that stage in your life, who does women's health and who does menopause care. So it's a bit like if you were moving into a new area and you went to a supermarket and you knew that maybe you have a vegan diet or you're vegetarian or you want halal food, you will find those sections very, very quickly because mm. you know you're going to do a shop in a couple of weeks. So exactly the same when it comes to your health care, you know, shop around, find out exactly who does that care. Is, in there, is there someone who does that at every GP surgery? 
be there should be um and if not you're you need to sort of say well who else would you recommend because there'll always be someone who has an interest in my practice we have two doctors and actually a nurse practitioner who has an interest in women's health as well so sometimes it's not actually just the gp there might be a nurse or an allied healthcare professional who has an interest in that area so find that out number two look at your symptoms understand your symptoms and make a list of them categorizing all of that even if they sound really banal so it could be do you know what i get tingling in my feet or feeling like spiders crawling up my skin or dry skin that comes and goes or vaginal dryness that comes and goes and then all those embarrassing symptoms as well so put those down look at, and look up the symptoms online because you can almost do a checklist um oh okay i have got that one haven't got that one and they might be things like joint pain i didn't realize that joint pain was a symptom um yeah. until i looked it up and also things like restless leg Things yeah. like that. And in Asian communities, we were talking about how difficult it is. Is like I said, the context of flushes is not important to them. So they'll complain of head to toe pain and psych psychological symptoms. They, they come out as pain as well. So make a note of all those symptoms and particularly the vaginal atrophy symptoms. And you can do a really quick Google and find those out. Then the next thing is, is book a double appointment. So by that, I mean that we have 10 minutes. So either take a partner or a friend along, but say to the receptionist, I want a routine appointment with X doctor, whoever does women's health. And I would like a double appointment, a 20 minute appointment because I want to discuss my perimenopause, menopausal symptoms and be as frank as that, because that means that the receptionist nice. can advertise where you go. And then the GP who looks at their diary goes, oh, I know Mrs. X is gonna come and speak to me about this. And then when you do that, go prepared. So the number four, go prepared for your consultation. I need your family history. I need your blood pressure. I need your weight. I need any um, past medical history. Because remember, a lot of GP practices, you might not see your normal doctor who knows all your history from when you had your immunizations. It might be a locum doctor who stepped in that right. day that has a specialism. So go prepared with that information. Any sort of breast cancer history that you might have had. Anything that you've tried already. So I really want to know alternatives because my answer always is, my sort of theory always is, is no one comes to see the doctor because they fancy the fun day out and thought, Do you know what, I'll just see Dr. Nagat today. They're there because they've tried stuff already and they've waited to come and see me. So I want to know all of that. And then lastly, do not expect HRT or a fix on the first consultation. I always say to my patients, so on the first consultation, I'm going to lower your expectations right now. This is more a conversation of meeting of minds. I need to find out and then go on on a discovery because actually a lot of the symptoms might not be menopausal at all. It could be that there is something else. So we have a differential diagnosis. So that means that menopause might be on the top of the list, but actually do I need to worry about ovarian pathology? Do I need to worry about fibroids because your periods are all over the place? Do I need to consider that you might be anemic? So I might send you off for a blood test and then that's the investigative process because I get a lot of patients who come in and their first expectation is, is she's going to give me something and it's going to quick fix me. But you and I, Davina, know it's not a quick fix. I mean, the thing about HRT um, in particular, because um, you, you would be very, very, very lucky to take the first combination of HRT and love it and for it to work brilliantly. So that didn't happen with me. Um, and I went to a GP, but I, I was told that I might be too young, but actually I've got hypothyroidism. And so sometimes when you've got hypothyroidism, you can get perimenopausal a bit younger. And that definitely was the case with me. And um, um, But I went and I tried the um, Eutrogestin progesterone pill in the evening and I had the patch um, estrogen. The patch estrogen actually suited me brilliantly. Um, I just needed to up the dose a little bit once I'd started. But um, the progesterone didn't agree with me at all. And I ended up putting in the coil. And it's all got to be, do your, do your research, look it up, um, look up what people are saying about it. I know you know, look, Facebook forums are sometimes a dangerous place because lots of us don't have the correct information, but all we can do is share our own personal experience. And if you're not giving medical advice on there, because we're not doctors, but you are sharing your own, you know, I could say to somebody, oh, well, I didn't get on with the Uchigestin pill either, but I swapped to the Marenicol and that worked for me. Then that's just like, well, look, if it worked for me, it might work for you. Why don't you talk to your doctor? And these are why this is why these Facebook groups are helpful, because if you're not seeking medical advice, which you shouldn't do on a Facebook group, but you just want to hear 
What's it like? What's your experience been like? Have you got any tips for bad sleep? Have you got any, you know, this kind of, this is what it's useful for. The public space forums I love because, you know, I engage with social media a lot, um, but they're not the place where you have medical advice, nuance in the medical advice. But what you can do is listen to a lived in experience from a patient. And I, as a clinician, use that a lot because we know and that's how actually sometimes I learn because I pick up things on social media or even something that my patient might have dropped in my consultation. And then I will mull away and go away and think about it and maybe look it up. So you're absolutely right. For some women, we realize that they might have a progesterone intolerance. Now, what do I mean by that? It means that the progesterone just isn't absorbed appropriately or, you know, right for them. So we normally Ooh. talk with a body identical HRT. So that's you, Trigestan, if anyone's wondering what we're talking about. This is made out of root vegetables and yams. This is a capsule version. And then there are different types of ways that you can take this. Now, some women might end up getting bloating with this. They might get headaches with this, breast tenderness, or their skin might break out. So therefore, an alternative might be that, yeah, we do need to give them a marina coil. Now, this is what a marina coil looks like. It's no bigger than about five millimeters. And there is a sort of an insertion process for that. But it could be that we just need to change the way that we give you the progesterone. Now, we also know in some women, if they are taking estrogen, now it comes as gels, it comes oh, as... I love you. You've got it all right there, Nagat. Oh, Amazing. I, I, like, I'm like a walking HRT. Great. Right. Because I like to show people. Because yeah, well, it's helpful. It's so helpful. And it takes the fear away. Because if you say to them, oh, do you know what? It's just a bit of gel, you know. Or it's like, and then they're just like, because some women imagine that the coil is going to be like a ship's anchor that I'm going to put inside them. And the minute I show it to them, they're like, oh, it's that small. So and also the thing about the patch, I always think it's worth saying that the patch is translucent. So it, it goes to the same color as anybody's skin. I think sometimes people with darker skin don't like the idea of wearing a white patch. It's not white. It's, it's kind of clear. So it does look like the color of your skin. And also, you, can, um, you can't really go wrong with hormones. I always find that people worry about where they're going to place it. Do you know what? The fattest bit of your body, if you want to put it there, because it's going to get absorbed into your fat cells mostly. And the most important thing is, is that if it falls off, just pop it back on or put in a new patch. And we have tablets as well. And then we also have a, a Lenzetto spray as well. And the absorption of estrogen varies. Now, we do know that some women can get estrogen intolerance or maybe they're not absorbing estrogen well enough and that's why it's not one size that fits all and it's a, a, an experiment but if you're going to go on the journey of hormone replacement therapy then i always say to my patients first one it's not a silver bullet give yourself between three months six months nine months and i will have to adjust the doses tweak a little bit and then you have to do the alternatives to hrt alongside that and think about lifestyle measures I was talking to um, Joe Wicks today because he, he very sweetly said, would you like to do um, a live with me? Because I get lots of women asking me about menopause and I don't know the first thing about it. So I'd love to learn about it. And will you come and just tell me what it is? I said, oh, my God, I'd love to. And what's so lovely about Joe Wicks asking me about that is because literally I would say the first remedy or the first thing that I would advise anybody to do um, with any illness is exercise and I don't when I say exercise I'm not talking about a hit class I'm just saying get out and walk or move or stay mobile or you know um get off your tube stop one stop early and walk that extra bit in the morning and do that every day and then do two tube stops and you know it's just about building up a kind of res resistance to exercise and you can do that as slowly as you want and find something you enjoy doing it doesn't have to be painful or something you hate and once you start, you will never regret it. But exercise is like the, the key to so many things, especially things like osteoporosis, um, you know, bones strengthening, things like that. And also lowering your risk of cancers as well. So we know that um, both of us know Professor Greg White really well. He scares me a lot because he's like this fitness machine. And he's always he's amazing, which um, I've told him already. <laughs> But too much and that's not going to happen but anyway he's done this amazing study which showed that we know that women who are overweight so a body of 30 and above in women who are over um, 50 their risk of breast cancer increases by 50 percent so being overweight and obesity is linked to cancer so we need to be tackling in this country obesity in a far more um 
proactive way because actually we know that the difficulty we have is that we're not we see um, obesity as a bit like a lifestyle choice and that is not the case at all it's a chronic disease but exercise underpins um, management for so many conditions I mean arthritis the nice guidance says the first thing you do is uh, exercise not even pain relief but if we go back to a group of patients because the idea is is that the only thing that will my menopausal symptoms is hormone replacement therapy and yes hormone replacement therapy is first line as a treatment however what do we do for women that can't have hrt or choose not to have hrt well exercise is one but we can't undermine and exclude the fact that alternatives to hrt have a huge beneficial effect so that could vary from woman to woman and this is why um, when it comes to women's health it's such a nuanced um, conversation Firstly, let's tackle breast cancer because that's the biggest issue that we have. And breast cancer, unfortunately, is so common. We see this, we know that the statistics are one in seven of us, um, as we get older, will end up getting breast cancer because we have the most amount of estrogen receptors, <laughs> look at me, <laughs> in our boobs. <laughs> so that means wherever estrogen is impacting on our cells and there's changes within those cells, cells will mutate or have, have a mistake at some point, And that's what we will say is cancer. Now, we've got to break up hormone replacement therapy into systemic, so something that goes throughout your whole body, and localized. So what am I talking about when it comes to localized? Well, let's talk about that. This is vaginal estrogen. Women who have breast cancer or have had breast cancer can very safely have vaginal estrogen. This is not the same as estrogen that goes throughout your whole body. Okay, so that's the first thing. So be really careful about when you and say... And how, how do you just explain to people how you put that in? Because that oh. looks like scary. This looks scary. So let me take it out so it's less scary. So this is the applicator. So if any woman has ever had thrush and might have used a vaginal pessary, she would be very sort of akin to this is um, sort of what's known as a vaginal applicator. So this is a little plunger. You push that. And at the end, you might be able to see there's a little tablet. Yep. This is estrogen in it. And this is um, Vagifem or Vagirux. Um, Vagirux, you just get one applicator. Vagifem, you get for each tablet, you get a loaded um, pessary with an applicator. It goes up the vagina and then you push the plunger and you leave it there. For the first two weeks, you will put one in every night. And then what that does is loads you up and then you go down to twice a week. What this does is treats what's known as genitourinary syndrome or the menopause or vaginal atrophy. Now, that's a long word, but basically what it does is it treats symptoms like vaginal itching, vaginal soreness, difficulty having sex. That is UTIs. Yeah, mm. you, yeah. In fact, it should be called bladder tablets rather than sort of vaginal tablets because it treats the genitourinary syndrome. But why is that significant for women with breast cancer? Well, the reason is is because it doesn't get absorbed, or even a tiny, teeny, tiny dose gets absorbed into the bloodstream. Therefore, it does not impact on the breast tissue, and so you won't get reoccurrence. Even if you're on tamoxifen or anastrozole, you won't. You can have um, uh, Vagifem and it stops all those vaginal urinary tract symptoms that you might be getting. For those women who don't want to put something in every day, they might have arthritis of the hand, Eastring is another option. So this is a pessary. So a lot of women get vaginal sort of prolapses as well as they get old. And again, exercise is great for that, Davina. But you can also, so there's different ways. There's about eight different types of topical vaginal estrogens. So topical vaginal estrogens are safe when it comes to cancer, safe if you've got clots. And actually, majority of women, I have not come across any women where I think it's unsafe. Systemic and the, uh, the, uh, just very quickly, the difference that that makes, if anybody's watching, sometimes the signs of um, having a dry vagina are quite subtle and you might not know, so you might not be getting recurring UTIs. I had this thing where um, I suddenly found it was quite painful just wiping myself after a wee. I thought, what's going on? Why is it Why is it hurting me to wipe? And then I suddenly realised that the paper was catching. Like it wasn't sliding Ooh. anymore. I know this is probably a little bit graphic, but it can be something as subtle as that. Or even sometimes people have talked about the fact that a Tampax won't stay um, in your vagina because there's not enough lubricant to make it expand. Um, or it can be hard to put in. Yeah. Um, so any of these things might be signs that you have got a dry vagina and this vaginal estrogen will absolutely revolutionize your life because it will give you a lovely, soft, squishy, lubricated um, vagina, which will be so much more comfortable. Um, and it's embarrassing to talk about, but it's something that the doctor will be absolutely used to. And you must mention it as a symptom. He, he or she will not mention it to you. You need to tell them. 
yeah there's a, there's something easy they can do about and it. And there's a lot of drive around getting oncologists to become comfortable with this because um, around the world. So I, I did a, a, a couple of uh, TikTok lives with um, specialists from America as well. And they're saying, do you know what? Start it before you even get the symptoms. If you know you're going through perimenopause, it's safe to start vaginal estrogen twice a week as your baseline before you even get the symptoms because why wait until you get those horrible symptoms yeah and then like almost like the horse has bolted by that time mm. but systemic estrogen so something like this like a patch or a gel that's going to go throughout your whole body that's a different argument now we know that if it goes throughout your whole body it's going to go in your bloodstream and affect your blood cells and that is where having a multidisciplinary so a conversation with your oncologist with a menopause specialist is really important and for some women unfortunately that depending on the type of breast cancer that they've got how aggressive it is then systemic estrogen is not advised at the moment according to the british menopause society what what about the alternatives well we talked about exercise already. Then what we do for those women who can't have HRT is that we look at what symptom is the most pervasive symptoms? What's affecting their most? Is it their sleep? Is it their mood symptoms? Because then we can tackle those individually. Now, antidepressants, and before anyone watching this goes, oh my God, antidepressants. Antidepressants at very low doses have proven on multiple clinical research trials to be really great for those insidious menopausal symptoms if you can't have HRT. Right. Um, so that's great. And the other thing that works really well, I'll say things like clonidine, which helps flushes as well. And then also we know that um, gabapentin and pregabalin, again, before someone says, oh, my God, they're terrible medications. Yes, they are medications that we use for other conditions, um, but they're great for that aches and pains and um, neuropathic pain that you might be getting or that tiredness and the fatigue that you're getting. Because sometimes you just need to help get rid of some of those aches and pains in order to be able to find the wherewithal to exercise. Yes. You know, because those aches and pains are going to stop you being able to get out of bed in the morning. Exactly. And actually, a little bit of medication might help stop the aches and get you exercising, which is a double whammy. The debate that I always have with my patients is a little bit of medicine for your quality of life or no medicine because you just want to live longer because you want to risk all the side effects that the tablet might have. Do you mm. want quality of life or quantity of life? And that is so mm. interesting for every patient. And remember, mm. if you, medication isn't always the answer. We know that from randomized control studies, acupuncture and yoga um, and um, herbal uh, medications for some patients can be great. But acupuncture is the, is the one where we have the most amount of evidence. And that's not for everybody because at the moment it's, it's not free. You have to pay for that. And, that yeah. and we've got a cost of living crisis for a lot of my NHS patients. That's just not accessible for them. But there are ways that we are trying to get that better within the NHS so that patients can access it. So let's talk about um, HRT and what, what you think of it in general. Like, what would you say then if somebody comes in and they're asking for HRT? Is it is it good or not? I don't think in your opinion, I don't think it's a simple clear cut. So. It always comes down to me, if I'm completely honest, as an individual choice. Yes. But if I talk about it personally for me, because I'm approaching that age and looking at the data, so I can only talk about me, so this is not generic for everybody else, and I completely appreciate that. But for me, the benefits of hormone replacement therapy outweigh the risk. Now, I know that I'm talking from a place of privilege, okay? And why am I talking from a place of privilege? Well, I don't have a family history of breast cancer. I don't have any underlying health conditions at all. And also, I have looked at the research and the data and the nuances of understanding that the risks for me um, are less and the benefits are more. Why am I looking at the benefits more? Because, well, I know that brain fog, um, aches and pains, um, also osteoporosis is higher and more common in my ethnic minority community. I'm Pakistani. I cover up from head to toe, even on a sweltering day like this. <laughs> so I'm not going to get a lot of vitamin D. So I need to protect my bones in the future. And yes, I'll get that some of it from doing weight bearing exercises, but I know I don't go in the sun a lot and I should, you know, have more vitamin D and calcium in my diet. But the data suggests that hormone replacement therapy builds up your bone a lot better as well. So if I can take a little bit of hormone replacement therapy for my future health, then for me, that's a no-brainer. It's better to start hormone replacement therapy in the perimenopausal phase. So, let yeah, me so this is something that's important because lots and lots of women think that, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll struggle on for as long yeah. as I can, not take HRT, and then when I really need to and I'm really on my knees, I'll take it. But actually, that's not the right time to do it. 
So let's look at the data when it comes to brain fog. And in fact, your second documentary covered this really well. And if someone hasn't seen it, I would recommend that you go and see it. Thanks. It's on all four, by the way. On yeah. all four, you can see it. It's available for free. Uh, it's anyway, free. That's the pitch done. <laughs> Thanks, if, Nika. If we look at the brain fog for years and years and years we actually medically gaslit women to say brain fog isn't a thing and even we did that when women were menstruating i become really clumsy and also my brain fog sets in even when i'm having a period now i'm approaching perimenopause but the data suggests from dr lisa Moscone, who you interviewed for your documentary which shows that actually scans and she's done lots of scans which shows that as the estrogen uh, decreases so i see estrogen as a lubricating um, sort of hormone i know i'm very oversimplifying it so, but that's the only way in my brain I can process the way estrogen works because it has multiple functions. So we have estrogen receptors from our head all the way down to our toe. Now, as our ovaries produce less estrogen, our brain goes, but I need this lovely estrogen because it's keeping all my neurons firing. So what it does is it gives that the responsibility elsewhere and works harder, hence why that brain fog sets in. But we know that when your brain has to work harder, it forms new pathways and new neur neurons and the theory is and this is just a theory this is why we think women have a five times higher risk of getting dementia and alzheimer's and therefore we shouldn't put up with that symptom of brain fog and allow our brain to do all the work we should be assisting it early on so therefore taking a little bit of estrogen looking at the risk factors for you is actually a good thing in that respect and then we go on to weight as well because that middle-aged spread look i'm getting it already i'm not gonna lie I'm uh, I, I it happened to me as well but i lost the impetus to exercise yeah i had no energy but um at the hrt when i went on hrt it really helped me get the willingness to exercise it didn't make me lose the weight but it did make me want to go and do something about it more yeah and and that's the thing because that impetus is really important so it also means that you find losing weight and shifting weight are really hard as well and again the theory is is because when the brain when the ovaries don't produce enough of that lovely estrogen it, the brain then shifts the responsibility i mean it's far more complex than this but i'm just really like narrowing it down to the fat cells because we know that estrogen isn't just produced in our ovaries and you know the womanly bits it, our fat cells do that as well so when that responsibility is put to the fat cells, the fat cells increase in size. So that belly fat that you have and you're having difficulty losing, because I can tell you in my 20s, I could eat a cake. Oh, I know. I can't shift that weight now. <laughs> it's crazy, right? And it comes overnight. It feels like it's suddenly there. I know. And then suddenly, before you know it, like, no offense to my mum, because she's beautiful, but I look like my mum. And I'm like, oh, how did this happen? <laughs> I was going to ask you because lots of people think, oh, you know, it was it was the um, accepted kind of um, it was the accepted knowledge that uh, you had to come off HRT after five years, but that's not the case anymore. So the NICE guidance were updated in 2019 and the updates that came in with that showed that because hormone replacement therapy has moved in so much. So earlier I showed you the tablet version. Now, why is this different to something like this, which is body identical? It's because this is a synthetic type of estrogen. So all the studies that they did before, like the WHI study, um, showed that actually synthetic estrogen, the risk factors were linked to breast cancer or the million women study, you know, it was linked to clots because this goes throughout your body this is your liver, your liver. Mm. and so your clotting factors are going to be triggered off and also your risk of breast cancer increased as well so the theory was was give the woman the smallest amount of estrogen and the progesterone that she needs for um, the shortest period of time just to get her through the transition but the studies and the data have moved on from that because we've been able to make sure that we get transdermal body identical so something it goes through the skin goes through the skin, so bypasses the liver, so you don't have your uh, risk of clots there. And also the, the studies that are out there at the moment, we need to do far more better study on women, show that actually there is a theory that it could cause less risk on someone who doesn't have any other risk factors on breast tissue than we thought before. And therefore now the guidance is that the woman can stay on hormone replacement therapy for as long as needed for the control of her menopausal symptoms. And this is where it varies as well. So for vaginal estrogen, so remember I showed you that earlier, for a lot of my patients- keep going forever, right? Lifelong, lifelong. Just like you brush your teeth to make sure your teeth don't get bad and you get plaque and your teeth fall out. This is exactly what you need to do. You're gonna live with your vagina until you're about 100. Yeah, so you, you want it to be comfortable, right? Yeah, exactly. Look after that bit of tissue. Yeah. 
And the guidance that I've listened to a lot of my colleagues and um, even, you know, colleagues who've had breast cancer and especially so Liz O'Ryden, who's a dear friend. And she said lifelong because it's absolutely safe if you're using a small amount to help those tissues in that area. And the other thing was um, that th there's a kind of myth that HRT postpones your menopause. Yeah, that's a lingering myth around that's been there for ages. OK, so this is my explanation of it. And I know it's not going to be scientifically accurate for a lot of those who are you know, nuanced in the ways, but we go through transitions, right? So the minute that we're born as women, um, we are born with the number of eggs that we need. And then we hit our puberty years and everybody remembers our puberty years. So you transition through there, your hormones go all, go all over the place. And then you go through your fertility years and then you want to have a baby and you transition through there. And every single time you have a baby, your boobs go up and then your boobs go down again because you're either breastfeeding or not breastfeeding and your body changes. And then you go through the transition of your um, uh, menopausal years. So that will start at perimenopause, a decade before you go through menopause, which is defined as one year without a period. And then you'll be postmenopause, which is one year and one day without a period. And you're postmenopausal for the rest of your days. Think back to your pregnancy days. Now, when you were pregnant, say that you needed folic acid. It was only for a temporary because we're literally replacing folic acid in your pregnancy to help the neural development of your baby and your health as well. We do exactly the same when it comes to hormone replacement therapy. We're not delaying anything. We don't delay the, you know, the development of a baby by giving replacements. And all this is, is doing is supplementing you back the hormones that you need. And what that does is just gives you that balance that you need in order to transition through that to help the menopausal symptoms. Um, the other thing I was asking, because I, I hear this more and more, by the way, Nega, this is amazing. And I know we've got to come to the end very soon, but one more question. And more and more I'm hearing about women under 45 um, definitely feeling like they're perimenopausal, often in their late 30s, mid to late 30s, and I know that the NICE guidelines are sort of 45 is the recognised possible start of perimenopausal symptoms. But what should a woman do if she's, if she's absolutely convinced that she's perimenopausal and she wants to go to her GP? How should she present her situation? So this is the nuances that we were talking about in regards to where are we? The data and the studies is what we go by. And yes, we have gender, health inequalities in regards to certain research. The cutoff at the moment is roughly around 40. But we know that women can go through early menopause before that, which is actually at the moment currently defined as primary ovarian insufficiency. Now, one in 100 women will go through that. I mean, that's quite a lot. That's a lot. I mean, I've got 100 friends on Facebook. OK, I'm all <laughs> but we know that one in 100 women will go through primary ovarian insufficiency. And is it because um, there's probably more than that and we're not picking them up? And they're the women that we really need to be supporting early. Do you remember I said about brain and, and so important? Yeah. Heart health. So they're the ones that we need to be um, supporting because their fertility will be affected as well. My guidance is, is if you think that you're that individual, I would refrain from using the word perimenopausal if it's below the age of about 38, because it, it gets mixed in with the natural transition. I would use the terminology, Dr. Arif, I think I have primary ovarian insufficiency. Ding, 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 ding. Any doctor ovarian. who will listen to you, will they? even if they're not doing women's health, they will be clued on about that condition. And they will start investigating you and refer you to the gynecologist early because okay. that's get... great advice. Yeah, we need to be getting those symptoms really looked at. The other group of women that I would say that don't use the word perimenopause is if you've gone through chemical menopause. What do I mean that if you have PMDD and we've given you medicines like gonadotrophins, then again, say, I think I might have chemical menopause. And the other group of women are below the age of 40 who've had their ovaries and womb removed because then by technical default, you've gone through what's known as surgical menopause. And again, don't use the word I am perimenopausal because anybody that is listening to that, the doctor's mind will be like, oh, this is a woman going through a transition. Natural. You have gone through surgical menopause, ding, 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 ding. So those key terminology and the nuances is really important. And this is what gets my gripe a lot because people say, well, why are you banging on about the menopause? Mm. Well, do you, guys, do you know what? It's not just older women that get this. It's younger women. The youngest mm -hmm. woman in the country has gone through primary ovarian insufficiency. I think she's 15. So the fact that we're not supporting these women early enough 
the fact that we're missing them is just heartbreaking because then they want to have families, the psychological impact. Mm far more in South Asian or especially because I can talk about my South Asian community because they don't understand the nuances and they think it just happens to older women so mm. I would be using perimenopause if you're below the age of 40. And also it's important to know that all these symptoms that you're having if you're frightened you're thinking but there's no way I could be going through perimenopause it might be POI so yeah. it's, it is worth checking checking that out and remember that terminology to go to the doctor i just want to say because i'm going to sign off in a minute but i wanted to say thank you nagat so much for coming on i'm so sorry again i was late and um i just want to say that if you are watching this and you know anybody share it share it share it share it as much as you can because um and share the information that you've learned with any women that you know doesn't matter how old they are if they're in their 20s or 30s or they might know somebody that might need this information if you're a woman or a man like this is important and finally i just wanted to say you are honestly not alone like davina has done a huge amount um but it's a conversation for men you know young everyone everyone and uh, it should be in your workplaces and there's a wealth of information that's out there so um never ever ever feel that you're by yourself and um there'll be hopefully more work that we'll do because we'll bang it we'll keep banging that drum Davina don't yeah we? and I'd love to have another conversation with you at some point soon so we can do this again oh I'd, I'd love that That'd be yeah awesome. <laughs> thank you so much it was so lovely to see you you're welcome have a really good afternoon stay I'm gonna... cool I'm going to melt now. Melt, <laughs> melt. Love you. Happy for